I was on New Caledonia for a short period of time. Then I was on Fiji. I joined the Americal Division on Fiji Island. They had been on Guadalcanal. The Americal had, and they were back on Fiji for a rest and regroup. So I joined them as what they call a casual replacement. I took somebody's place that had been sick or wounded or, or killed or whatever. And we were we were on Fiji for about <clears throat> two months, and um, they uh, we got our Christmas packages around the first of December because we were going to be on on board ship on Christmas Day. So about the middle of uh, uh, December, we aborted ships, and on Christmas Eve, 1943, we were anchored off the coast of Guadalcanal, getting ready to go into Bo Bougainville the next day. So the next day, uh, after Christmas, day after Christmas, I guess it was Christmas Day, we landed in, in, in Bougainville. In Bougainville, the, the Army, the Air Force had a couple of fighter strips, and those fighter planes were, the bombers from, the, from down south would come up, and the fighter, fighter planes would pick those bombers up and escort them to places like Rabaul and places further north to give them protection. And um, that was our duty to protect those two airfields while we were on Bougainville. And we were on Bougainville for so long, I don't know, for several months. And then we went from there to Leyte. And we fought in Leyte in, in Ormoc. I mean, that was one of, the, one of the cities, I guess you would say, in Leyte. We were in Leyte. We were there for oh, a whole couple of months, and they pulled us off, and we made a beachhead in Cebu. Cebu, Cebu City is the second largest city in the Philippines. And we made the initial landing in, in, in Cebu. And uh, that was probably in January. I don't know what the time. I don't, can't, can't give you the month. But anyway, we were in, we were in Cebu for, for for several months, and then they um, uh, at one time I, there's usually about a, a thousand men in a battalion, and at one time our, our battalion was down to 200 officers and men. Everybody wasn't killed. A lot of people were sick, and so uh, I was one of the ones that was sick. So I had a dysentery. And they sent me back to a field hospital, and I stayed there for a week, and then they flew me back to Leyte to a general hospital. And at the general hospital, I was there for about three months, getting, getting well from uh, amoeba dys dysentery. And while I was in, in uh, the 133rd general hospital in Leyte recuperating, uh, the point system was in effect at, time, at that time. The point system is you got a point for this and a point for that, and and, and you, when you got to have 65 points, then you got to be sent home. This was something about new as far as the war in, in Europe had only been over a couple of three months, and they started this point system. Okay, while I was there, we got a lot of new people back in our, uh, in our, in our company, in our division. And when I got back, they had to give them am amphibious training and, and all that stuff, getting ready to go to Tokyo. And uh, I had been back for oh, about, I guess, three or four weeks. and. Um, our chaplain told us one day, boys, if you've got any good advice to say, now's the time to say it, because you probably won't get another chance. And uh, so we were going to be the initial landing, and we were going to be uh, on the beachhead. I was usually the third wave. The third wave went in six minutes after the first wave. And we figured they'd, stop it, they'd stack us up on the, on the beaches in Japan just like stacking cordwood. Anyway, when the war, when they dropped the atomic bomb then, and that changed the whole complexion of the war. And we already had our winter uniforms, we had our shipping crates, and they put us on boats and sent us to Japan. We sailed into Tokyo Bay one day after the armistice term. The, the uh, Missouri and all the big battleships that took place and took a part in the sign of the armistice were still in Tokyo Bay. So, uh, <clears throat> uh, but our planes had not bombed the railroad tracks, now the, now the, now the docks. So our ship sailed right into Tokyo, Yokohama, and we walked right down the game plan, just like you, like, like there had been a war. In, in the summer of 1942, they, uh, all 19-, 20-year-old boys had to register for the draft. And so, of course, I registered. And along about uh, the 1st of November, the dean of men at various schools called me in and said, Taurus, if you don't do something, you're going to be, you're going to be drafted probably the next two or three months. I said, well, what can we do? He said, you can join the reserve. It may keep you out till, till the end of the school year. And the only, one I, the only reserve that I could join was, I, was the Army Reserve because I, I didn't have a birth certificate. When I was born in 1923, I was the unnamed son of Horace L. and Sally Thomas Klein. 
And, but uh, they didn't give me a name. So I had to prove that I was that unnamed unnamed son. Well, by the time I got that done, I was in Bougainville. Anyway, uh, so I, went, I joined the reserve, and along, along about the middle of March, or last of March, they told us that they were, we were not going to get to finish school, that we were going to have to go before the end of the school term. So along about the 1st of April, we got our orders to report to Fort McPherson. And uh, so I went to Fort McPherson and reported on April the 10th, 1943. I really hadn't had much of a home for a long, long time. Uh, my daddy died when I was seven. My mother died when I was 11. And I lived with an uncle of mine up in Tennessee until age 15. And at age 15, I came to, to Rome to be a school. Bury School was, a school, was a, a school that you could work your way through. And I had an uncle and aunt who lived in Rome, and they thought that Bury would be a good place for me. And I was ready to, get, I was ready to leave Loudoun. I, I was ready to get away from Loudoun. It was a small town. It wasn't much bigger than Cave Spring back then, but during the war, Oak Hill made it, made it boom. Well, we were reported about 3 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, and it, it rained like pouring, pouring water out of a boot. It rained so hard we didn't get to go to chow that night, so we, we, missed, we missed supper. My first meal in the service I missed because it was raining so hard. And we didn't, all we had was a cold on our back because that's all we were supposed to bring with us. That's what we had on our back. So if we got wet, we wouldn't have any dry clothes to put on. How much did you know about the war before Japan bombed? Oh, we, uh, we, we kind of kept up with it because we knew that, you know, that uh, things weren't going too well. And it wouldn't be too long till we were going to probably be a part of it. When the when the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor, everybody said, "Oh, he said that we'll whip the Japs in 90 days." And so I, I thought well, I was a senior in high school, and I thought, "Well, I, I hope <laughs> I hope the war's not over before I get in." And then I got in, and I thought I never would get out. <laughs> <laughs> I played basketball. I went to Sunday school and church. On everybody had Barry had to go to Sunday school and church on Sunday morning. Sunday afternoon, I played basketball and all afternoon. And I got back to the dormitory to go to, to go to, to dinner that night, and they were saying that the Japs had bombed Pearl Harbor. Well, I never had heard of Pearl Harbor. I didn't know what Pearl Harbor was. I knew it was going to be tough, and we were. It was in the summertime. I was stationed at Camp Robinson, Arkansas, and it was it was in May, June, and July, and August. Talking about hot. Oh, it was so hot. It's almost when you would come home for lunch. For lunch and the uh, only thing you'd want was something cold to drink. You, wouldn't care, you didn't care anything about anything to eat. You just wanted something cold to drink. Went to Fort Ord, California. Fort Ord was a POE, Port of Embark Embarkation. That's, that's where they, everybody that was going to the Pacific went to Fort Ord, California. And we were there for about three or four weeks until they got everything processed. They got, gave us, took away our winter clothes and gave us uh, all khakis and stuff like that. Because we were going, where well, we were going, we didn't need one in uniform. We knew we were going to be in the infantry because we were taking infantry training. And uh, they started us out just by you know, basic, you know, for teaching you how to march. And then they taught you the parts of the rifle and then the parts of the machine gun and parts of the bazooka. And, and uh, at the end of the training, why, we had a, a, a camp out in the woods for about two weeks before we used, you know, you, the boy said you would hog or die. And uh, the food wasn't very much out there, and water was scarce, and it was it was pretty tough. Part of the time, I was uh, I was in a uh, anti tank platoon. Uh, anti tank. A N T I, uh huh. Anti T A N K anti tank platoon. And then I uh, then I transferred out of that to a to a to a mission center, where we received and uh, and sent message. You know, did I did 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 I. And uh, we had to know the code. Every day we had a new code. We had to change. We had a, a machine, and this machine, we set that machine to correspond to the codes throughout the South South Pacific. So, so the Japs wouldn't, if they get, if they happen to get a message the next day, the message would not be the same because we'd have a different code. We had a machine that we that set the codes, and then we had to transfer the messages through those through those through those uh, machines. Well, we were about halfway up a hill, and we've been trying to take that hill for a couple of days. And um, the message came down. I had a radio on my back, and it was my duty to take messages and relay them to the to the uh, battalion commander and so forth. And I wondered what I wondered what uh, just wondered. It went through my mind. What's going to happen? Here, President Roosevelt had been 
uh, and the president all during the war. He you know, he has known everything that went on, and, and Harry Truman had just taken office a short while before, and he hadn't had time to get versed in, in all the details that went on. I just wondered what effect uh, President Roosevelt dying would have on, on us as, a, as infantry soldiers. The first of all, combat was in Bougainville. We had a, we, in Bougainville, we had we had a, a, a trench that went from um, went around the those the uh, air the airstrips I was telling you about, and it was our duty to keep the Japs from coming in and, and and retaking those airstrips because they were vital to the air force because these um, these uh, uh, fighters had to escort the bombers, and and the Japs made several attacks at, on us while we were there, and Bougainville had a it had a volcano, an active volcano, and, and, and at daytime you could see the smoke coming out of the top of it, and at night you could see the sparks coming out of the, out of the, out of the top of the volcano, and there was a stream of water that went around the base of it, and, it, and, and the water was real warm, and it tastes just like sulfur. If you were in a canteen of water, you, you drink sulfur water. At that, if you were in that area where you had to have, had to have water. We had patrols that went out during the daytime, uh, eight, five, five and eight and ten men, sometimes fifteen men patrols would go out in the jungle in daytime to see, try to find out what the Japs were doing, if they were trying to organize to, to, to make an attack on us or just what we were supposed to do. So at night, we stood, we stood duty in, 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 the, in the trenches where we were. And the, and the trench went all the way around the, 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 where the airstrips were. And, uh, and we could walk in, in, uh, in, in the trenches at night without, you know, without being bothered because the, the, the trenches were built up and the Japs couldn't see us moving around. But uh, we were on duty uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just waiting to see what was going to happen. What were the biggest differences between yourself and the people there? Do you remember anything about that? In, in the Philippines? Well, <laughs> a lot of the Philippines could speak English. And which was uh, down in the jungle in, in Bougainville, places like that. All they used to was the natives, and, and they they were not the civil. Most of them didn't look like they were civilized. They just wore a little skirt around their mid bottoms, you know. And they'd have, they'd have all these uh, burnt places. They different tribes would would have burnt places on their bodies to emphasize what 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 group they, they belonged to. And and um, uh, so we didn't have any, we didn't have anything to do with them. The time that I was the most afraid was when we made the, made the beachhead in Cebu. And because uh, we had been in, they put you in these little flat bottom boats and you circle around and around and around for about two or three hours. And the more you circle, the, the rougher the water gets. And most of the boys, thank goodness, I was never seasick. But a lot of the boys would sort of be so sick when they would hit the beaches, they didn't care when they got killed or not. And uh, they just throw, they just throw, they throw, they throw up in their helmet and and push it over the side and then throw up more and push it. And that some of them would be plum green from being sick. He would be out there for about two or three hours just going around and around and around in a circle. And then all of a sudden you'd hit to the beach. And when you got to the beach, the Japs had a, had, a, had the beaches mined. They, uh, real good. And you'd be you'd be walking along and you'd see a guy and all the things you'd see was a steel helmet going through. He'd stepped under a landmine or a personnel mine or something like that. And you'd try to step where he stepped so that you, could, you wouldn't step on it. On mine, you're afraid to afraid to lay, lay down. Afraid you lay down on, on mine, it would blow your kingdom come. I guess that was the most uh, my most bad part of it. And of course, we were not looking forward to going to Japan as as as, as invasion troops. And nobody was looking forward to going to Japan because they figured they they would just mow us down, just like uh, just. They had the children trained and women trained and everybody else trained to defend that. And while we were in Japan, we we were uh, we went to uh, while we were in Japan on daytime they would we we get on trucks and jeeps and ride around out in the countryside to make to make sure that that the Japs were not trying to maybe uh, gang up on us and to try to you know to attack us. But we never had any trouble. I never, as far as I know, that I was only there about 10 weeks and I had enough points that I, was, I got to come home. I probably could have gotten a purple heart if I had tried, but I, uh, what I mean by that, some of the boys would just get a little scratch and they would complain and they, they, they would be awarded. But
but most of the, I, I figure the Purple Heart, you, if you want, need, had a Purple Heart, you needed to be actually uh, wounded bad. If you were where they could bring you hot food, they would bring you uh, m m uh, meals that were cooked in the kitchen. If you were on some outpost somewhere and, and, uh, and, that, and you, know, you had C rations or K rations or whatever the case was. But most of the time, the food, if you, when you had food from the kitchen, it was dehydrated, like a dehydrated eggs, which, you, which was hard to, to, to digest. But it didn't make a difference how hungry you were. Those powdered eggs were hard. To, well, I came home and had one week. I had, 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 had a week's leave was all I had. And I came home and um, came to Rome, and, and I stayed with my aunt and uncle in Rome while I was on leave that, 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 for that week. And I went back up into the... Tennessee to see the people up there that I knew for a day or two, and by that time it was time to go back to Camp Robinson. Tokyo Rose was a lady who <clears throat> had been uh, been in the United States. She was Japanese, and she had been educated in the United States, and she had this propaganda show. And that, that night, uh, when we would, when you could listen to Armed Forces radio, her radio was powerful enough that she could break in and play play these tunes, you know, that were familiar to us when we were back in the States, and she'd say, okay, you suckers down in the South Pacific, said the Imperial Navy is going to blow you plumb out of the sight. Said, all the way, how about your wife back, back home dating those four L's? Four, four said, what do you think about that? And she'd just, you know, say everything like that and try to discourage you and try to, of course, it, 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 it didn't have too much effect because we liked, we liked her music. She played good music. Well, the one that I kept in contact with for, for, for so he was a, a second lieutenant, and he was, our, he was our platoon leader, and he was from Knoxville, Tennessee. But after, as the years went by, well, we, we lost contact, and it wasn't too many years, so we, we, we went. But now, a lot of the boys that I was in service with, we sent Christmas cards every year to each other, and, and kind of brought each other up as to what we were doing. But then after you get get married, why you don't have you know you you're busy trying to make a living and so forth and and you, and those things kind of just drop by the wayside. I wish I had continued it, but I, you know, women in the mills, I, I never did come in contact with any of them. <laughs> they didn't want women. They didn't want women if that's where we were. I'm sure they did a good job. They took they took uh, jobs of uh, soldiers that they could been up there fighting. You know, they like that uh, secretaries and people like that. And, and they drove trucks and vehicles, but we didn't have any women with us. Well, when the, when the war in Europe ended, uh, it was, um, I guess, several hours after they, or they declared our mistress before we found we, before we found out about it. And uh, just like when they when they when they uh, invaded Europe, we 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 didn't know for a day or two that they had invaded Europe. We just get the messages that had come down and to to the. And we didn't know whether we were making progress or whether they were kicking us off the France coast of France or just what. So it's a, you know, it's, it's kind of a strange feeling to have to uh, not know. You know, it's, I know what's going on, but you don't know how we're doing. And we finally had a map on a, on a bulletin board in our company and uh, with the map of Europe. And um, we, they had a, a string with pins. And as our troops would move up, well, well, that, uh, we would move that pin up, and if we move move back, we'd move that pin back, and that's how we kind of kept up with the advance of the American forces in in Europe. And when the war in uh, in uh, in uh, when Japan said they were going to surrender, uh, the first time they dropped an atomic bomb, we were we were in Cebu, and we were they, they were treating us pretty good. They were feeding us pretty good. We said that we said that we getting us fat, getting us fat enough up for the kill, <laughs> and and uh, then a lot of them, a lot of them just got up and gone to a to a movie. Except me and two or three more boys, and we were in the first Rogers tent listening to the Armed Forces radio. Well, we had cut it off, and somebody said um, said it was almost eight o'clock. Somebody said turn the radio on and see what the eight o'clock news are. And other guys said, oh, it won't be anything different. So we turned it on and announced that the Japanese, had, I mean the Americans, had dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima or Nagasaki, whichever it was. And so we called over to the, over to the movie and told them about it, and they stopped the movie, and everybody came back to the company area and listened to the radio for all night long to see what was going to, what, what was going to happen. Because, we, you know, it was real important to us. It was like death, almost life or death. Long about the 1st of October of the 1945, an announcement came down from General MacArthur's headquarters one day and said he wanted everybody to listen to the radio 
on a certain, certain day at a certain, certain time that he had an important announcement that he was going to make. So we couldn't wait to see what it was. So when that day came, we were all hooped together around the radio. And the first thing he did, he congratulated us for making, having a good job and so forth. And it was, the occupation troops were going to go fine. And he said, another thing I want to, I want to announce is that I'm going to announce that when the, when the rotation of troops back to the United States, and he said the first the first division that will be rotated back to the States was the Maricow Division. That was us. And you can imagine the excitement and joy. And um, what they did, the, the people now in the Maricow that had enough points, they uh, they kept them there but, and they transferred the other guys out to other outfits and, and transferred people in from the other outfits who had enough points to, to make us the division. So we set sail about the middle of uh, November for the United States, we didn't know where, but we we ended up in Seattle, Washington. It was a great it was a great uh, uh, feeling to uh, to hear the United States radio come on. We we were probably I don't know maybe a day or two out when we could pick up the radio from the United States, and um, uh, and then when when we got, when we got to Seattle, uh, we they took us out to Fort Walker. And when we came down the game plan in Seattle, they gave us a, 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 a Small bottle of milk and some donuts, and uh, and we went and we were we were at Fort Walton for about a week. And we were waiting for a troop train. Everybody that was coming to the to Georgia was waiting for a troop train. And this girl down to PX, we went down there, and we could tell we thought she was from from the South. We hadn't seen a white woman or talked to a white woman except in the movies or at USO show for several months, for twenty six months. And we went down one one day. I said. Where are you from? She says, I'm from Carterville, Georgia. Man, that, that was music to our ears. <laughs> Southern girl. <laughs> I got out December 13th. We got back to the United States around Thanksgiving time, and I waited about a week at Fort Walton before the troop train, and then it took about, about a week for the troop train to come across the northern part of the United States and down to Fort, uh, Fort McPherson. And I got discharged just as soon as I could, December 13th, 1943. It was a happy day. It sleeted and rained all day long. That day we stood out in the rain and cold and sleet to, to get that discharge. I went to work for the Veterans Administration uh, uh, trying to help uh, other people decide what they were going to do and trying to, to give them advice. And, and I had about 25 or 30 guys that I looked after here in Floyd County. And I went around to their homes and anything that I could help them with or maybe give them advice. I couldn't. If I didn't know what it was, I tried to find out for him. Then I went back to school, went back to pharmacy school. Uh, and, and I went to pharmacy school and graduated from pharmacy school and came back to Chase Springs and we opened a drugstore and had a drugstore here for 53 years. We sold the drugstore last, last April. It's been about 16, 15, 16 months now. But for a long time after I got out of service, I had, a, I had dysentery. I could eat something that had berries in it. I could eat uh, like uh, lettuce, eat blackberries or, or anything like that. Man, it was just like giving me a dose of castor oil. Eat strawberries. I carried a, I carried a bottle of medicine around my pocket just about all the time in case I did eat something and I wasn't supposed to. And I'd chug a look at that uh, bottle of medicine. Just to, and then finally it just, it just went away. Uh, I went to a doctor in Rome one day and he told me I had an irritated colon. That was what was causing that from that amoeba. Amoeba dysentery is, is, is a parasite. And if there's parasites that get in you, they eat, they eat holes in, you, in your stomach. And uh, they were trying to keep that from happening to me. And like I said, I was in the hospital for about three months in, uh, in Leyte at, at, at 133rd General Hospital in the summer of 1945. You know, we'd come to a stream and it didn't, it, it, we just take our canteen. We had tablets that we were supposed to put in our water, but you would be so thirsty you wouldn't even, you just drink it, and then you walk up the stream 10 or 15 yards and you see a dead javelin in the water. <laughs> You've never been that thirsty, have you? <laughs> Tell you what. You don't know how precious water is. Every time I go back there and get me some water, I think, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful glass of water. Well, you know, we thought that was going to be the water in all wars. I mean, that was, that was what everybody thought, just like World War I. They thought World War I was going to be the war to end all wars. And then we came along with World War II. And they had the United Nations and all that thing, but it, uh, we still have them. We're fighting now here. 
and just wars. The Bible says there'll be wars and rumors of wars. And so uh, uh, you just hope you don't have to go back. There were times where we had a little signal. If we were just sleeping in like four men foxholes, which is what you tried to do cause troops so you wouldn't have to be up all night. And you took turns uh, waking and stand up for two or three hours and then you'd sleep for two or three hours and somebody else. Uh, we were sleeping uh, four four men to we'd just dig them just deep enough to because we were going to move out the next day. We'd just dig it deep deep enough to protect our bodies. And and uh, if you had to get up and go to the if you had to go to the bathroom in time during the night, what we usually did, we just throw a rock to each side of the uh, to the guys on each side and tell them you're going to go to the bathroom. Well, this this happened right next to where, where I was sitting, and it uh, really get makes you think. This guy got up to go to, to the bathroom, and well, you don't walk up to the guys in your because you think they're dead, dead asleep, and they're not going to wake up anyway. So you go use the bathroom, and this guy went and used the bathroom and came back. And when he got back to almost three fox, so one of his buddies looked up and saw him, thought he was a jab, killed him dead in the doorknob. The first combat was in Bougainville, and going from Fiji to Bougainville, I saw more Japs and fought more Japs aboard ship than I saw the rest of the whole war, because I was scared to death. Uh, the uh, the people that that we were with had been on Guadalcanal, and they told us all these frightening stories about what happened on Guadalcanal. Well, at night you'd go to your dream, and your dream you have nightmares, and these Japs would have you surrendered. And I saw more Japs, fought, I saw more action on the ship going from uh, uh, Fiji to Bougainville than I saw on Bougainville, actually. But we we got I got pictures of of, of where we, in Bougainville where we just pile the Japs up and just push them over, dug a, dug a, a, a hole with bulldozers and pushed them, pushed them over in a hole and went, went on our way. We in, in the Philippines. Uh, we had been trying to take this hill for two days and, and um, finally along about four o'clock one afternoon we were able to get to the top. And um, they were going to relieve us and let another company come up and, 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 and keep it to the end of the night. So this friend of mine who I had gone to school with at Berry, I would see him occasionally, and when I'd see him, we'd stop and talk, and he'd say, who have you heard from, and so forth, back home. And so this particular day, he came by, and I said, he stopped, and I said, Smitty, I said, you better keep your head down. It's pretty tough up there tonight. He said, you know, Smith, that did that, said, I said, I'll be okay. Well, next morning, the first thing I heard, he'd been killed that night. It's, you know, it's kind of scary, scary thing. It makes you feel real, real bad. Then, a, then a, another boy, and I, and I, I don't know why he did it. He had a, a wife and a little, little girl he'd never seen back home in California, and he was a real good friend of mine. And we were in the Philippines in, in Cebu, and for some reason, it was open land. He got up and just ran across the field trying to uh, towards a, a Japanese foxhole. Well, then you know they killed him just like that. And he had this little girl back home that he'd never seen, and, his, and she never had seen him, of course. So, you know, those things, those things. And you have people who come to you. Had one guy that uh, came to me. He was older than I. And I don't know why he came to me, but he came to me one day and told me he wanted to talk to me. And I said, okay. He said, well, just had just, just gotten a Dear John letter from his wife. You know what a Dear John letter is? Uh-huh. Dear John letter is usually a letter you get from your wife or your girlfriend or for your fiancé or whatever the case may be. Somebody, that, some female that you're real close to telling you she's, she's through. And this is it. And this boy, this boy was a coal miner. Up in up in West Virginia, and uh, this, this guy, one, one guy I'm talking about, and he um, he just couldn't understand why his wife, uh, you know, would would not wait for him to come back, and he didn't have any, you know, it just it just and they really knocked him for a loop, and not any other men who got dear John when all the others were, you know, they were they were the same way. It was it really knocked him for, you know, it was it was real shocking. They were the song during World War Two. I met her on Monday, the meeting was grand. The next day was Tuesday, and I held her hand. On Wednesday night, I gave a nickel to a freckle faced brother, and, and then from Saturday, you got married. That's about the way we were almost. It was, uh, he said I couldn't wait to get married. <laughs>